everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to London. I'm a medical physicist and two things really fascinate me, light and the human brain. But what fascinates me most is how we can use light to understand human brain function. And I've spent the last 25 years developing techniques that do exactly that. So I'd like to start by getting you to understand how light can see into your own tissue. So I want you to all get out your mobile phones and switch on the flashlight as I'm doing here. I know you were told to put them away. I want you to get them out, switch them on, and turn on the white flashlight. Great. Now I want you to cover that flashlight with either your finger or your thumb, and then hold that up into the air so we can see. What can you see around you now? Lots of bright red fingers and thumbs. So the reason they look bright red is because the blood inside your tissue contains lots of oxygen. The more blood that's in there, the brighter red your finger will glow. And so just by shining light on your finger, we can work out the colour of your blood and therefore how much oxygen it contains. Now, I've told you I'm not interested in fingers, I'm interested in brains. So let's try putting this against your head. <laughs> Nothing happens. That's because we've got a nice, thick, protective skull that's looking after our brain. So let's all put our phones away, including me. So how do we overcome this problem? Well, as ever, physics has the solution. So instead of using visible white light, we use invisible near-infrared light. Bone, and particularly your skull, is transparent to light in the near-infrared part of the spectrum. So we can literally create an optical window into your brain. We can shine light into your brain and get it to glow as we did your fingers. We can look at the colour of that glow and that will tell us, tell us how much oxygen is in your brain. This technique is called near-infrared spectroscopy, or NEARS for short. And the image that I'm showing you now has been acquired from an adult human brain using near-infrared light. You can see these wonderful colours, these dynamic changes. That's the oxygen in the brain moving around as the brain performs different functions. And this is pretty much what's going on in your brain right now as you're listening to this talk. This technology is really cool and it's really good at measuring brain function. It's completely safe. The levels of light we use don't harm the tissue. It's inexpensive. And it doesn't require big, bulky instrumentation that you might normally associate with brain imaging. And for this reason, it's been used extensively to understand infant development. This is just a very few group of babies from the hundreds of babies that have had their brains imaged using near-infrared spectroscopy at Birkbeck Baby Lab here in London. And I've been working for two decades with these group of neurodevelopmental psychologists optimizing near-infrared spectroscopy techniques to allow us to understand brain development, to understand typical and atypical brain development. And the work now is moving forward to identify markers of children at risk much earlier than any other techniques can show us. So, back in 2011, I got a virtual knock on the door. I got an email from the Medical Research Council in the Gambia. And they shared with me the work that they were doing, looking at the effect of malnutrition on infant growth. They showed me some data that they had from head circumference measurements, which shows that these babies' heads do not grow appropriately. Essentially, these babies have head growth faltering in the first two years of life. They wanted to know whether this small head syndrome was associated with a deficit in brain development, but they had no way of measuring brain development or brain imaging in the rural setting in the Gambia. So they asked me a really straightforward question. Can we use near-infrared spectroscopy to image babies' brains in Gambia and find out more about their brain development? Well, I took a moment because I had no background in global health. I have no expertise in nutrition. I had never been to the Gambia. In fact, I'd never been to Africa. But I said, OK, let's try. But as all you scientists in the room, you're going to know that the next thing I said was, we're going to need some funding. <laughs> and so at this point, I was introduced to the Bill and Melinda Gates Grand Challenges Scheme, and more specifically, the Grand Challenge Exploration Scheme. Now, we decided that our idea was both daring and unconventional, and therefore it qualified for this award. 
So we applied for and secured a phase one grant to take brain imaging to the Gambia. So in February of 2013, we packed up our brain imaging equipment in London. We put it into a box and took it with us as excess luggage on a flight to Banjul, the capital of the Gambia. We put it in a Land Rover and we drove three hours into the African bush to a small village called Kenaba, where the field station is. And this is what happened next. The following day, we set up our equipment in the laboratory we were given. Within an hour, we'd set it up in the same way that we would do in the UK. Within an hour and a half, we were training a local field worker, Seku. And in just over two hours, we had our first mother and baby arrive. We went ahead and performed a study that we'd performed many times before in the UK. The infant sits on his mum's lap. He's presented with a range of auditory and visual stimuli. You can see that he's looking at a screen here. And he's wearing a cap that contains all the near-infrared sources and detectors. And as he's watching these images and listening to these sounds, those oxygen distributions are happening in his, in his brain, and we can measure those using near-infrared light and find out about his brain function. Just a few minutes later, we had finished our study. <laughs> now, this little chap looks pretty surprised, doesn't he? And there's a reason for that, although he didn't know it at the time, and we didn't know it at the time. This is the very first infant to ever have their brain imaged in Africa. So this is 2013, and it's sort of unbelievable that it took this long, because we have been imaging babies' brains in Europe, in Japan, in America for many, many years. But it wasn't until we got this Grand Challenge Award that that connection was made that enabled us to take our technology to Africa. For the remainder of our phase one grant, we went ahead and measured babies during the first two years of life. And we have now established brain markers of development over that first critical 1,000 days window. So you may be asking, why is this so important? Well, in 2016, it's estimated that one in three, one third of the children living in resource poor settings fail to meet their developmental milestones. And this can have an impact on the rest of their lives in terms of their academic achievement, their mental health, their ability to form and sustain healthy relationships. These children are surviving, but they are not necessarily thriving. This equates to 80 million children. One in three, which one of these children in our Gambian clinic will not fulfill their potential? We know that infants in resource-poor settings are exposed to a range of different risks. Malnutrition, infectious diseases, poverty, low-quality health care and early years education. We know that their growth can be stunted, but we just do not know enough about what's happening to their brain. And most importantly, if we're going to develop targeted and effective interventions, nutritional or otherwise, that are going to save and protect these babies' brains, we need robust and objective markers of their brain development. And I believe that near-infrared spectroscopy can offer this. Now, for those of you that are funded by the Gates Foundation in the room, you will be very familiar with the idea that Gates are impatient optimists. They want our innovations to make impact at scale. So in concert with the Foundation, our team have been working really hard in the last couple of years to connect with as many global health researchers as possible, to find out from them what do you need from a brain imaging system, how can we meet these needs, and to think for ourselves, how can we make the biggest impact with this work. We're currently collaborating on a study in Bangladesh looking at stunted children, and I'm really pleased to see that we now have, for the first time, brain development markers being measured by the same tool in three different continents. And this is a really great example of where this technology can provide cross-cultural comparisons that haven't been very easy to acquire in the past. Now, last week, I was at a NIRS brain imaging conference in Paris, and for the first time ever, we had a whole session dedicated exclusively to the application of our technology in global health. We basically created a whole new research field. And studies were presented at that meeting from Guinea-Bissau, Colombia, Uganda, and India. And I'm really confident that we're going to see many more studies like this coming through. Meanwhile, we have secured further Gates funding 
for a longitudinal study of both Gambian and, importantly, UK inference as a reference sample, we're going to be developing brain function for age curves, like the growth curves that you might be familiar with for your own children, but these now are charting brain development. This is the first time that this will ever have been done on two sites with an intensive catalogue of measures that we're going to take. And these will be helped to inform interventions that will be helping to protect and save these babies' brains. Our project's called the Bright Study. It's brain imaging in global health. And please do look us up on Twitter and follow the experiences that we're having. One of the things I'm most excited about with this project is how it's brought two communities together, global health and brain imaging. And it's at that interface that we're really excited about the innovations that come next. As physicists and engineers, we're already working on smaller, lighter, wearable instrumentation. We're thinking about what the end user needs. And I now am personally invested in developing near-infrared technologies that are specifically targeted at helping us understand the brains of the world's poorest children. Because in my view, these are our most precious global resource. Thank you very much.